I gotta piss, I'll be right back, hold on. I kinda do have to piss, but I'm gonna hold it. I'm gonna hold it for you guys. I fucking, give yourselves a round of applause for being here, you guys are amazing. This is why I love Brooklyn in particular. I love New York, and I was very happy to be able to get the opportunity to film my special here. But I love all that New York shit. I do, I'm a sucker for it. Earlier today, I talk about pissing. I saw a dude pissing on the side of a building. I don't want to make eye contact with him, but he made eye contact with me. And the guy was great. He's sitting there pissing. He looks at me and goes, they don't make them like they used to. I don't know what the fuck that meant. But it, the world made more sense after he said it. It just kind of did, right? It's always good. Uh, also, two guys almost got into a fight 35 minutes ago outside this place. And it was wonderful to see. And I knew I was getting old because I didn't immediately take my phone out to start filming. I just kind of, I was present. And I think that's what's missing. People aren't present to watch a street fight anymore. They watch street fights through their phone. Do they go and watch those street fights later down the road? Probably not, they forget they have the footage. I like the uh, age demographics in here. Makes me feel good. Anyone here under the age of 25? <laughs> good, I hate those people. I do. I'm glad there are no under 25 year olds here. Although I think there's a few and you're fucking lying. <laughs> now look, I'm not gonna come up here and hate on the younger generation. I hate when people do that. Every generation has their problems. Every generation sucks, to be honest. My pro and I don't even hate Gen Z. I like Gen Z. There's a lot to like about Gen Z. I think the future's bright with them. They're bringing back 90s fashion. Huge fan of that, right? Because I'm, I'm getting older and I want my clothes to be a little bit baggier again. I miss that. I like some Gen Z slang. Calling someone a simp is hilarious. It's always very funny. But here's what I don't like about Gen Z. Gen Z is very mean. They're mean people. I don't know if you know that. They're like mean in a like bully sense. I'll give you an example. Here's a, here's a thing I'm going through in my life right now. I'm currently being aged out of one of my favorite bars. I'm becoming too old for it. And it's sad to me because I've been going there for a very long time, right? And it's, it's alarming at the rate in which I'm being pushed away. I don't know if that's happened to anyone else in their 30s here. You go to a bar for a long time, you're like, I love this place. And then you start to look around and you're like, hmm, do we lower the drinking age to 12? What the fuck happened? Why is... Why does everybody look so young? This is... And it's always the dudes. The dudes look way younger to me. Women look their ages. I mean that. Why well, do we see these guys? This one guy, I'm like, there's no way he belongs in here. And I said, hey, let me see your ID. I carded him. And I was nowhere near a door. I was in the middle... I was in the middle of a bar, and he, was, he gave it to me like a fucking... Like a simp. That's what he did. He gave it to me like a fucking simp. And I'm like, 23, really, 23. That, never a hair grew out of that face. Never once, like 20. And look, I'm not saying you're manlier if you could grow facial hair, but I do feel like in a drinking setting, you should be able to have had, that should be the new law. Forget age. It should be, have you grown facial hair? And I need women to pluck the chin hair, the two. It's not just. And then the flip side of that, if you're 15 and you got a full beard, get the fuck in here, get in here. <laughs> have a shot, you're clearly clearly stressed from taking care of a relative, I'm sure, right? Get in there. <laughs> Did he have a full beard at 15? I can tell you're pointing at him like crazy. By the way, I didn't even need you to point at him. I knew he had a full beard since 15. <laughs> Look at this guy. That's fucking strong, man. I like that, man. I'm still new to the whole beard thing. I don't know. I've only had mine for a few months. Is that all right? Do you ever just fucking pull hairs out of it when you're stressed? It's fucking weird, right? I'll do it while I'm driving, and then I'll put the hairs on the steering wheel. I don't know why... I don't know why I told you guys that. Nowhere, nowhere my set list is, confess something creepy as fuck about yourself. But I did. I think I did that for the front row, because I think the front row is not sure how to judge me just yet. I'm a weirdo like the rest of you, right? I just, I'm just wearing a new jacket. That's the only difference. So we're at the bar, right? And here's, a, here's what happened. I'm, I'm at like a high top round table that you see in most bars with a few of my friends. We're drinking, enjoying ourselves. The bar was packed this night, really loud, Bumper to bumper, so many people. And I noticed this woman, let's say she's where the bar stool is, right? She's about five, six feet away. I noticed her because she was talking on her phone and she was talking loudly. Why was she talking loudly? Because we were in a loud bar and that's how you talk on a phone. It's just right away, I'm like, why the fuck is she on her phone? I got mad. I got mad for the person on the other end. 
Because she wasn't just on her phone for a few minutes. She was on her phone for 20 minutes. And the person on the other end had to be like, fucking text me, please. Just text me like we all do all the time. Why are you calling me from a loud bar, right? It was driving me nuts. And my friends were like, you got to get over this. I'm like, I'll get over this when I fucking interview her after she hangs up because I got to find out. (laughs) She gets off the phone and I go, hey, look, I don't mean to pry, but right away I got to ask this. How could you hear anything? She looks me up and down and goes, um, because I'm not 100? <laughs> yeah, some 22, 23-year-old. She called me 100 years old. There's no cool comeback for that. I can't be like, you're fucking 100. I'm not 100, you're 100. Like, it doesn't work. But then I wasn't going to take this line down. She starts to walk away a little bit. I'm like, oh, hold on, hold on a second there. What are you, like, 22, 23? She's like, yeah, I'm 23. I'm like, okay, you're 23, I'm 37. So again, if you're 23, your mom's probably about 50, 52. I'm going to fuck your mom, okay? (laughs) I'm going to fuck your mom, break up your parents' marriage, have fun celebrating two Christmases forever, all because you were a piece of shit to a stranger, all right? That's on you now. And yeah, I'm married, but my wife's not going to care because it's about teaching lessons and we're a teaching family, all right? We're an education first household, so. So I'm in therapy now. And um, this woman wasn't the main reason. The main reason I find, I, I, there's a lot of reasons. I should have been in, yeah, anyway. Um, I finally decided to, get therapy because my two-year-old son told me to relax. (laughs) Yeah, he's two, and he could tell I was getting upset, and he's like, Daddy, relax. And I responded by being like, what'd you say, bro? Like, I don't know why. (laughs) I don't even normally say, bro, but in that moment, it felt like, what the fuck are you to tell me to relax? I made you, damn it. Like, you know, also, I didn't know you knew the word relax. What the fuck is going on on Sesame Street? Are they teaching you to talk back? Huh? But then I took, a, I took a beat, and I'm like, no, that's fair. You're right. That's, uh, that's a good observation by you, little one. Daddy needs professional help. Um, so, yeah, I've been seeing a therapist for almost a year now, and uh, I've been, I'd been real quiet about it. I didn't tell anybody for, like, the first six months. I had that real, like, Irish Catholic thing where it's like, you shove that shit down. Don't tell anybody, right? You don't need help. You're not vulnerable, you know? And then one day I was hanging out with some friends, and uh, I told them, I go, I've actually been in therapy for, like, almost eight months now. And all of them responded the same way. They said, finally, thank God. This is amazing news. You're in therapy? Oh, we've been asking you for decades. Woo, you know? And I responded by saying, or, or maybe if you guys were just better fucking friends, I wouldn't need therapy. Did you ever think of that? Maybe if you guys just agreed with me all the time and did everything I wanted to do, I wouldn't have a $100 a week copay. Did you guys fucking think of that shit? No, you didn't? Okay. Those of you who aren't laughing are clearly on my therapist's side too, huh? <laughs> you guys are on the personal responsibility train? All right, fine. I feel ganged up on it. I don't like that. Just to let you know, it's something I'm working out in therapy. The main thing I'm working out in therapy is that I'm a very confrontational person. I don't know if you guys have picked up on that thus far. Um, and I don't mean to be. Everyone's wired differently. Everyone's different, right? I know a lot of people who are like, I'm non-confrontational. And I think that's great. I'm jealous of them. But I also don't get them. Because again, I'm wired where it's like, I have a problem with you. I am now going to tell you that problem to your face. But I try, I try not to be mean about it. Like, I don't, I'm not trying to be a dick. Although I do realize I start a lot of phrases by sentences by saying, look, I'm just being honest. <laughs> and that's code for, I'm, I'm about to be a cunt real quick. Um, I hope you're prepared for that. But yeah, you don't want to be confrontational. Again, I'm in my late 30s now. That's just not, it's not a good look be the guy that's always just like, I'll fucking go up. But then as I'm working on it, though, my friends aren't helping. I've told them I'm like trying to be more chill. I'm working on my temper, which means I'm also working on being confrontational, trying to avoid stressful situations, all that. And then there's times where they're just like, yeah, but that dude smells bad, and we need you to tell him he smells bad. (laughs) So be that guy for just today. Today, can you be that guy still? And it's hard. It's hard to avoid confrontation. I'll tell you guys about a time not that long ago. It was about a month or so ago, and then a lot of comedians say this happened a month ago. This one literally did. Um, it wasn't six years ago when I wrote the joke. It happened a month ago. <laughs> I was waiting for the train, minding my own business, uh, sitting on a bench, 
And this guy came walking toward me, and I caught him out of the corner of my eye because he just looked like every white meth head you've ever seen. Just, he looked like all of them. Um, like, if I asked everyone here, draw a picture of a meth head, and you guys showed me the picture, I'd be like, you're all, you all got right. It's all different, but right, you know? He's wearing these, like, ripped flannel pajama pants. They're just all ripped up. He was wearing a Blockbuster t-shirt, but it wasn't like a cool, ironic one. It was like, this was his old work shirt, you know? He used to work at Blockbuster, and he has not gone past what happened to Blockbuster. For the under 25s, it's a video. Anyway, um, I got a lot of fans on TikTok. I should be slowing this down, I just realized. Uh, but he comes walking up, and what stuck out the most about him was he was holding a hot dog that was, had a 7-Eleven box. He was eating a 7-Eleven hot dog with no condiments on it. Just a very, that's like a serial killer red flag, right? Like, dude, you're eating a 7-Eleven hot dog, already disgusting, and you decided to go plain. You went plain with that hot dog. That was the choice you made. I don't think it's extra for condiments at 7-Eleven. I don't. Um, so he comes up to me, and again, I'm just looking forward on the bench. He comes up to me, stands like right above me for a split second, and goes, get the fuck up. And I'm looking at him, and I'm just like, there's a voice in my head that's like, just throw him on the tracks. And there's... <laughs> you could pretend like you're tying your shoe, you headbutt his chest, and he fucking fell. I don't know what happened. Like, but then I'm in therapy now, so it's like, all right, you can't, you just, you can't attempt murder. You can't do that. So I decided, I looked at him, and then I, I thought, you know what, Joe? This guy clearly needs the bench more than you. This is his hot dog eating bench. This is where he eats hot dogs. He's wearing a Blockbuster shirt, a 7-Eleven hot dog. You're wearing AirPods. You win. You win this one, right? <laughs> And I'm like, you know what? Enjoy your bench, sir. I hope, I hope it all works out for you. And I decided to walk a little bit further up this way off the platform because I didn't want to get on the same part of the train as him. Didn't work out that way. Train came, we get on the same part. Train's not that crowded, but there's, there's enough people. I decide to sit as far away as possible, looking that way. I don't want to do anything with this guy. I want no part of this dude, right? But then I hear the guy. He's yelling at someone, and he's yelling loudly. And I'm like, oh, God, I hear what he's saying. I don't like what he's saying. He was yelling homosexual slurs. And I look... And I look at the guy, I'm like, okay, he's yelling homosexual slurs at a gay man. Someone needs to tell this guy to shut the fuck up, right? But then I'm also like, Joe, you're working on not being confrontational. But then there's like this good voice in my head that's like, fuck this guy. He's committing a hate crime in front of everybody. And then another part of me was like, I don't know this gay guy. He could be a shitty gay guy. Why do I have to get involved? <laughs> Maybe he litters. I don't know what the fuck is going on with him. Well, and I have to risk getting gut stabbed over that guy? I don't know, you know? So I try to ignore it, but then I hear it heating up a little bit, and I'm looking around, no one's doing anything. And then again, there's part of me that's like, this is the problem. Nobody sticks up for anybody. No one tells an asshole to shut the fuck up when that asshole needs to be told to shut the fuck up. You know what, Joe? Fuck your therapy. You're getting involved. <laughs> so this is important. There was no one sitting right next to me. So when I sit to the side, I kick my leg up like this. <laughs> threw my arm back over the seat. I'm telling you this because when two people are about to go at it, who's ever, whoever looks more comfortable is going to win. <laughs> I look more comfortable. I'm showing this guy I don't give a fuck right now. You know what I mean? I thought about taking my shoes off to really throw... <laughs> so I look at him and I decide, you know what? I'm not going to go through typical insults. I'm going to get in his mind a little bit. And I go, yo, asshole. He is not your problem in life. He has done nothing to you. He gets to ride the train in peace. So why don't you leave him the fuck? And right when I'm about to finish that sentence, the gay guy leans over to me and goes, hey, man, I actually go by they, them pronouns. So. <laughs> Dude, I respect your pronouns, but I was on a fucking roll. Do you understand me? I had, I had momentum going, you know what I mean? You could have told me afterwards. You could have told me. I was, I, I was going to like level up to like a Captain America style speech, right? I was going to get into how he's a bigot and all that. I was going to have everyone on the train standing up clapping, and we were going to get him to get off at the next stop, even if it's not his next stop, right? And then I look at the, the meth head, and he's like, this actually is my stop. And I'm like, fuck you. No, it wasn't. No, you sit back down. You sit back down. I have more speech to get. You sit. I thought about it. I later, it was in my head for like a good week. I'm like, maybe I should assume they? Should I assume they for everyone? Maybe that'd be fair, right? But then I'm like, that meth head, man. If I called, if I said they get to ride the train in peace, he looks across at one person, his head would have exploded all over the... <laughs> Something to think about, though. 
So I'm taking care of my mental health, but I'm also taking care of my physical health. You know, so I, uh, I actually made a doctor's appointment to have a physical exam, which was a big deal because I'd never made my own doctor's appointment. As an, I'm 37, and I'd never, <laughs> I was always like, that'll go away eventually. Um, but I decided, I'm like, you know what, I gotta take care of myself. And I made a physical, I remember the, specifically the appointment was for a Wednesday morning, because I remember the Sunday before that Wednesday, that Sunday evening, I was wrestling with my sons, because I'm like a real, I'm a real cool fun dad. So I'm wrestling with my sons, <laughs> And my sons are five and three. And I don't know if you've ever wrestled with a five and a three-year-old, but you dominate, right? You, uh, <laughs> you kick ass. They're, they're, they're 75 pounds combined. They're so weak, right? And I'm just talking so much shit. I'm like, you can't see me, right? I'm doing like the Hulk Hogan, right? I'm like <laughs> power bombing them. I was dominating. But during the midst of my domination, I think the little three-year-old had had enough. So he straight up gave me the old Shawn Michaels super kick. Remember the super kick? When he goes straight out like that, he went straight out with a high super kick. His little foot hit my right testicle directly. <laughs> he got nothing but right ball. I saw a flash of white and then blacked out. It was insanely painful. And I'd been hit there before, so I know how painful it could be. But here's a little fun fact. For the people in the room who don't have testicles, here's a fun fact for you. I don't know the science behind it, but for whatever reason, getting hit in one nut hurts more than getting hit in both. I'll repeat, getting hit in one nut hurts more than both. I don't know why, but I have a theory. I think when you get hit in both nuts, the left and the right are like, we're in this together, I got you, come on. <laughs> Fucking hold me, dude, we'll get through this, I love you, you're my boy. Mm, right? There's, there's like a tightness. They feel like there's togetherness. But when you get hit in one nut, in my case, the right one, I think the left one that day was just chilling. Be like, nice day out, nice day, nice day. Not too hot down here. That's good, it's good, it's a good day, it's a good day. So how you doing? What the fuck happened to you? He sees his boy went down and testicles are nothing but empathetic. So he takes on the pain. He feels the pain too. He goes into shock from the pain and then he gets it worse than the right one. So they're both in a lot of pain at that point. Nobody Google this. I don't know if any of this is correct, but that's my theory about why it hurts more to get hit in one nut than both. The problem with this joke is half the men are like, fuck it, stop talking about it. Oh, it hurts. And it hurt, it did. Because again, like I said before, I've been hitting the nuts before. You know what it's like. There's like a little bit of pain. Stomach hurts a little bit afterwards, but you know you'll be fine after an hour, right? This was not. I was, like, I was going on day three, and it was still a lot, a lot of pain. You know, and I'm like, well, thank God I got this doctor's appointment. So I'm like, well, I'll just have to add this to the list of things we got to do. Because it was a full physical. I was getting blood drawn, right? Everything was getting checked. Uh, there was new labs. I go in and I find out that I had a, a female doctor for the first time in my life, which you guys heard the joke earlier. I'm an ally, clearly. So I'm down with that, right? <laughs> and um, <laughs> all right. that, was a, that was a Brooklyn response, by the way. Okay, it was a little bit. You guys are great, but I felt like you're like, wait a minute. No, he's being silly. All right, we're on board. <laughs> so I go in and um, I, I tell my doctor what happened. And she's like, all right, well, I'll examine and, you know, all this stuff. And uh, before it came time for her to examine that area, I had a flashback to high school. And I remember how dumb we all were as high school boys. Because I remember one time hanging out and my friends being like, dude, wouldn't it be awesome to have a hot female doctor checking out your balls? Wouldn't that be awesome? No, it's fucking not. It sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it may be cool at 17, but at 37, it's terrible. Let me tell you why, because the doctor's office is like the least sexual place in the world. There's nothing sexual about it, right? You usually go down a long, shitty hallway where there's other doors, and you're like, what's happening in there? Are people dying in there? No. Yeah. <laughs> you get to the doctor's office, it's always painted that same paint, right? It's like beige, tan, this like anti-boner paint, you know? <laughs> All the, all the posters on the wall are horrifying. They're all like, AIDS, you probably have it. Right, all the posters. <laughs> HPV, stop spreading it, you pervs. Right, all the, all, just, all the posters are. And I just get, I get very nervous and queasy in like medical situations. I'm just, I just don't like the whole scenario. And so she did the whole you know, physical check and everything else. And then it came time to check that. And then uh, she's like, well, if you just want to stand up. and Because, you know, I was laying down on the, on the thing. I didn't know how she was going to approach it. But she was like, you can stand up and then lower your pants. And as I was lowering my pants, she was on a wheelie chair. And um, 
And then she wheeled up to me. And <laughs> it did make me kind of go, all right, hold on. Like, I've never had anyone wheel up to my balls before. <laughs> the only time during the whole thing where I got like, that might be kind of sexy to think about. I'll file that one away. But, um... <laughs> So I'll, I'll, you know, I lowered my pants, and uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you all, I, um, I was not at my best that day. I was not. And uh, just like there's no cool way to come back from being called 100, there's no cool way to be like, this isn't the real me. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't the real me. I want, I want to let you know that um, it's very cold in here. Um, also, do you see the wrinkle lines? That means it gets bigger. That's what that means. <laughs> That means it expands. Do they, do they teach you that in medical school? Is there a chapter? Is there a chapter in one of your books that, that told you that if it's all wrinkled up like that, that means it gets long, you know. I just want to be clear about that. So I, of course, left the doctor's office that day in shame. I had a lot of shame. And I remember the next morning uh, going on my chart because, you know, I, they drew my blood, so I had lab results to check. And I'm like, all right, cool, my lab results are in. And I go on the good old my chart, and I'm, I'm scrolling down, reading all the lab results, and I'm like, oh, cholesterol's good. Nice. You know, liver function, way better than I thought. Awesome, cool. I'm going through, liking what I'm seeing so far. Then as I get toward the bottom, I see the word testicles with a note, and I'm like, okay, this is, uh, is going to be different because I'm about to read someone's note about, about my balls, you know? <laughs> and it said testicles, colon, one word note, and that one word was symmetrical. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, that's pretty good. I'll take that. I like that. I like that. If I ever become single, that'll go on the old dating profile, you know? It's like, you like symmetry, girl? I got symmetry. What's up? Then underneath that, it said penis with a note. Yeah, that's how I felt. And I'm like, fuck, what is this note going to say? It said penis, colon, normal. Fucking normal, really? She might as well have written, has a nice personality. Like, Fuck you, normal. I told my wife, I'm like, we're making a follow-up appointment and I'm showing up to that with a rock hard boner. That's what we're doing. I got a reputation to get back. And then my wife, who's a nurse, was like, hey, dumbass, they either write normal or abnormal. Those are the only two choices. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. It would have been weird if she wrote surprisingly thick. It would have been <laughs> accurate, but a strange note. To... <laughs> here's what I've understood. Here's what I've learned as a parent. You try to take every little thing you can and teach it, and turn it into a teaching moment, right? Everything's a moment which you could teach a lesson. I remember we were driving through the city, and my oldest son, was, he's five, he had never seen a homeless person before. And he sees a homeless guy holding a sign, like, you know, just a couple cars ahead of us. And he was like, Daddy what's that guy's sign say? And I'm like, oh, buddy, he's homeless. He's, he's asking for help. We, you know, we could give him a dollar or two when we drive up if you'd like to. And he's like, okay, but what, is, what does that mean? He's homeless. I'm like, I'm like oh, my God, he doesn't even know. I'm like, oh, it means he lives outside. And again, my five-year-old son, the sweetest kid in the world, is like, he lives outside? Why? And I'm like, he didn't eat his vegetables. Uh, <laughs> So it's something you might want to, you know. <laughs> Kids been eating broccoli by the pound ever since, so hey. But uh, it's been a, it's, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you guys, it's been a really hard year. It's been, um, 2022 has been the worst year of my life. Uh, I'll, some of you are laughing already, which is fine. That's fine. I want you to laugh. Uh, my, I mean, it's not funny. My dad died suddenly at the end of January, so about, what, eight or nine months ago, and it's been really hard. My dad was like my hero. We were super close. We talked all the time. We lived in neighborhood apart, so I'd see him like three or four times a week. And, and I, I said, it's okay that you laugh because I'm going to tell you guys some stories about my dad. And I want you to laugh because for whatever reason, there's this new thing in comedy where people take a 10-minute timeout from being funny and they get serious. It's like the real world in the 90s or something, right? Like, <laughs> we're going to get real. And that's fine if that's what you want to do, but I know my dad would hate that shit because my dad was my biggest comedy influence, and growing up, whenever we'd watch a sitcom with like a very special Roseanne, we'd be like, fuck, just be funny, okay? 
Dan loses his job. Darlene ran away from home. We're like, could they just fucking yell at each other at the kitchen table like all the other weeks and be funny? Like that's, you guys don't remember the show, Roseanne. That's fine, that's fine. <laughs> But yeah, so um, it's been hard. It's been hard. It's been, uh, it's, I've never experienced grief like this before. And it's rough, but through therapy, I'm trying to focus on the positives, you know? And I think my dad had four kids who all loved and adored him so much. You know, we're all going through hell without him. And I think that's something he should be proud of, right? He's got, he had two daughters. Both of my sisters are teachers. My younger brother's in medical school, right? And me, I talk about my balls in front of strangers. So <laughs> a lot to be proud of right there. And I've been doing some research. You know, my dad died suddenly. Like, no one saw it coming, which made it really hard. But that's the number one way people want to die. They want to die in their sleep. Like, he went to bed and just didn't wake up. And I, I did a bunch of reading about the subject matter, and they polled a lot of people. And in the poll, that was the number one way people wanted to die, was peacefully in their sleep. So I take solace in the fact that he wasn't suffering at the end. You know, he wasn't in a lot of pain. The interesting thing was the number two way people wanted to die was while having sex. That was number two. <laughs> And I'm thinking they must have only pulled men. <laughs> because it's like, yeah, you went out enjoying something you love, but you fucked up sex for the other person for a little bit, right? <laughs> also, I don't think women would choose that because they know how fucked up men are, and we would probably try to finish. And anyway, um, <laughs> I shouldn't have said we with that. They would try to finish. <laughs> the, those sick fucks would try to finish it. So that's why they didn't pull straight women, because they'd be like, no, we don't want to die that way. Not with, not with those gross fucks on top of us. That'd be horrible. <laughs> so yeah, I think to myself, my dad was so funny. He was such a funny guy. And I, that's why it was really hard for me. When, I, when it happened, I took a couple months off of stand-up, because I just didn't want to be around funny things, because it would just make me think of my dad. And you know, he wasn't a comedian himself, but he could have been. He was so funny. He was quick wit, real sharp. I remember one time at dinner, this was in high school. My stepmom had come in, and she was a little bit sad. And we're like, oh, what's wrong? She's like, oh, I can't make my sister's wedding. And my, my aunt, who I love to death, was getting married for the third time. And um, you know, for whatever reason, my stepmom couldn't make her sister's wedding. She was real bummed about it. And then she's like, oh, I just feel like I should be there. And my dad, without hesitation, said, don't worry. You'll catch the next one. <laughs> he was just funny as hell like that. I remember another time. My older sister came into the house. I was hanging out there, it was like 23, 24, Tuesday afternoon. So it was very weird for my sister, a teacher, to just walk through the door. She comes in and we're like, what the hell are you doing here? Shouldn't you be teaching? She said, oh, you guys didn't see? Turn on the news, there was a bomb threat at my high school. They sent everyone home, of course. And we're like, oh, that's crazy. And she goes, and dad, get this. All of the parents came to pick up all of their kids. And it made me think, if there was a bomb threat when I was in high school, would you come pick me up, dad? And then he up goes, hell no, why would I drive towards a bomb? That makes no sense. If you called me, I would tell you to walk away from the school. Let's get you four or five blocks outside the radius. I pick you up, we have lunch. It's a great time. It's gonna be fine. <laughs> and my dad was an amazing grandpa. Some people, you ever see some people and you're like, that dude was destined to be a grandpa. That was my dad. My dad went fully like gray at like 34, right? I mean, he died at 67, his hair was white at that time. But like, you still white hair, that's a grandpa. White hair, a little bit of a belly, big guy, like 6'3". My, grand, my sons loved him. They adored their grandfather. Main reason was because he was like their sugar dealer. He was the guy, you know, I couldn't get them to eat healthy because he was sneaking them Twinkies and honey buns, all that shit. So when grandpa came over, they just got this high instantly where they're like, fucking grandpa's hair, let's fucking go, right? They were getting all jacked up. They're all like fucking coked up, right? They'd meet him at the fucking car door, be like, grandpa, come in with fucking whipped cream, hostess all over their face. Yeah, they loved him. And um, my oldest son, I named after my dad, um, which is like the Irish Catholic way of being like, I love you, Dad. You did a good job. Uh, I would never say that to his face, but I named a kid after him to be like, see, you did you're good. You did good. I told someone once, I'm like, I think the last time I hugged my dad, I was like six. And they're like, oh, my God, that's so sad. I'm like, no, we had a great relationship. That was our relationship. I remember when he hugged me when I was six. I remember specifically, I like forgot my lunch at home or something, and he came into the first grade, first grade classroom, gave me the lunch, gave me a hug, and we both looked at each other like, that was fucking weird. That was weird. I think I've grown out of the hug thing. Like, if I would have hugged him when I was like randomly 27, he'd be like, do you have cancer? Why are you hugging me? Is something bad gonna happen? Like, it was real sad, you know? So my oldest son loved his grandpa so much, so it was really hard, because he was at the age where I'm like, all right, we have to tell him. Like, my other son was two at the time, so two-year-olds don't really get death. So I had to tell my five-year-old about death. 
and I'd always avoided talking about death. I remember we'd watch Lion King. I would skip the scene when Mufasa died. I'd be like, what's that? Fucking fast forward, right? I didn't want to, because I'm his Mufasa. I didn't want you know, him to try to kill my brother down the road for no reason. But then I thought, I'm like, he needs to watch it with that scene because one day down the road, he's going to be 10 at some party and be like, what the fuck is happening here? Is this a different cut? Like, you know, not understanding why Mufasa is getting trampled, you know? And uh, so we always avoided talking about death. And then, you know, I had to tell him it was really hard and he wasn't quite wrapping his brain around it. And we're at the wake, Catholic wake, you know, so open casket. We're by the coffin. And uh, this really sucked. My, uh, you know, my, my sweet little five-year-old son you know, he looks at his grandpa, and he looks at me, and he goes, Dad, why won't grandpa wake up? And I was like, well, grandpa didn't eat his vegetables. So. <laughs> you guys were a lot of fun tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of you. I'm Joe Kilgown. Thanks again. Great. Give it up for yourselves. You were great. Um, 